Hello, so uh, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Bruce Getzman, uh, Professor Emeritus, University of Cincinnati. Alright, so uh, first question I'd like to ask you is when did you come to UC and uh, what brought you here? Well, it brought me here because they offered me a job. <laughs> I came in 1959. 1959, okay. Nice. So, what was like the hiring process for uh, for you back then? Well, back then, uh, <clears throat> you applied for a job, and if they responded that they were interested in you, they invited you to the campus. Mm -hmm. uh, if you weren't uh, from probably overseas or someplace. Why did you go to campus to uh, get acquainted and for them to look you over? And you met with, and I met with the dean of our college, which was called Applied Arts in those days. Yeah. And <clears throat> then they brought in the, some other professors, and then they talked to you, and uh, then if they were at all interested, they said, well, we'll put you up for the night. <laughs> and they, they put me up for the night, and I, at the Terrace Plaza Hotel, as it was called in those days, downtown. And <clears throat> the uh, next day, they took me to see a vice president, and eventually the president of the university. Uh, for a final okay, but by the time you got to see the president, they pretty much said, yeah, we guess what we want you. So they made me a job offer and I moved. Yeah, nice. So uh, a much simpler process in those okay. days than it is today. Now you have to get a clearance from uh, government and uh, <clears throat> I know I a few years ago, I taught a course, in fact, three or four years ago, and uh, I had to apply, and it took something like six weeks to get clearance from the government, checking back on all past employers and all this and that, see whether they had any criminal record or not. I don't think they bothered in those days. Okay. So, um, did you teach like architecture when you were there uh, when they first hired you? Oh yes. Okay. I was hired to teach architectural design, mm -hmm. and architecture, graphics, drawing, wrestling. Uh, architectural students uh, used the T square and triangle. Now they use a computer. Nice, nice. So, um, so when you were at uh, mm -hmm. UC. Like, what did you want, like, your students to take away from your classes? Well, <clears throat> any teacher wants them uh, to come away with a realization that uh, they've learned something, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Not every student does, but uh, <laughs> we would like them to. But you hope that they've gotten something out of your time with them. Uh, architectural design uh, is a... <clears throat> very time-consuming process and it's very one-on-one -on -one other than a, a lecture program. And so uh, uh, you get to know your students pretty well and their capabilities. And uh, in that respect, uh, uh, you had, when I first started, we had uh, 12 hours of contact with students in the design studio every week. Mm -hmm. Not that you saw each student every day, but you had a chance to uh, sit with them and then look at their work and talk to them and get to know them pretty well. Uh, and what their strengths were, what their backgrounds were, which is a good thing. Which is, to a degree, of course, in a big lecture format that you have, it's hard to do that. Yeah. So, um, so I'm guessing, uh, so you, I'm guessing you like teaching, so, like... Well, I kept at it for 40 years. 40 years, yeah, that's fine. So why did you like? Well, again, you know, like, just to be facetious, it's a, uh, it's a friend of mine, our colleague of mine at the office said that teaching was a, a, a really 
a great part-time job, but a lousy full-time job as far as that goes for as far as reward, economic rewards. But uh, anyway, sure. I, hopefully people don't stay in academia if they don't like what they're doing. Uh, you have to. <clears throat> All right. So um, another question, I guess, would be, uh, what was like relationship among your colleagues like back then when you were teaching? Well, our college was quite small at that time. I think we had only 900 students, which uh, so we got to know all the faculty people in all the various disciplines. As time went on, as the college got bigger, uh, that became a little more difficult. We used to have a faculty lounge in our college, and so we would meet faculty people there, and all the faculty mailboxes were there. So that's where all the communications came down to you. You went into the faculty mail room or lounge and got your coffee and had uh, picked up your mail. And uh, it was right across the hallway from the main office in the college. So, it, uh, uh, but uh, basically it was a, a more collegial environment, I think, early on. As the university grew and as the College grew, of course, that changed a bit and became more departmental focused. This is, I think, true today. Mostly uh, things tend to uh, be more grouped around the college or around the department, I should say, uh, rather than the college. Hmm. Okay. So, um, since you were, you were there, like you said, 40 years, mm -hmm. um, what changes did you see like throughout like the vision of the uh, UC. Well, of course, UC when I came here was a city school, mm -hmm. and that's where they're relatively small, and it became a state affiliated school in the 1960s, late 60s. And the reason for that was they wanted to grow, they didn't have any money. The only uh, levy support for the university was from the city and Gulf Manor, a suburb. The rest of the suburbs didn't have tax levies to support the university. So uh, as the suburban areas grew, the population grew in that respect, they, they had to become state affiliated. That was the first step before coming complete, becoming a complete state university. And uh, state affiliation brought money, no question mm -hmm. about that. It also brought bureaucracy. And uh, what I like to relate, when I first came to my college, uh, we had a dean. Mm -hmm. The dean had a secretary, and there were two secretaries in the outer office of the college. And there was a history student that came over two afternoons a week, part-time, and ran the mimeograph machine. Now, you don't even know what a mimeograph yeah, I was machine like, was. Oh, that okay. Well, this was, of course, before computers or anything else. Uh, everything had to be done on a special paper uh, that imprinted them. And then that was run through the mimeograph machine and inked and things came out. So you couldn't run, run in and get a Xerox of something. Uh, right away you had to get it in a line so either I think Thursday and Friday or Thursday was the day that the graduate student came over and ran it. And then we had one faculty member that was uh, relieved of a class to do scheduling. And that was about it. We didn't even have department chairman in those days. Just a lead professor in each discipline. So, uh, it's a far cry from what administration is today in any college. In fact, there are more administrative people in the Department of Architecture and Interior Design in the college than there were originally in 1959 in the whole college. But, you know, that's one of the problems, uh, I think, of the university uh, because the administration has ballooned. 
probably at the expense of faculty. Uh, there are more part-time people teaching, although we certainly had part-timers uh, in those days too, teaching various, in various disciplines. Okay. So um, I guess this would lead to uh, another question I had, which would be like, uh, what changes did you see like over like the university as it like transformed throughout like the years, oh. like with the buildings and like how expanded? Yeah. Well, stuff? of course, when I came, uh, Gap, or as it's called now, mm -hmm. uh, was a uh, had the original uh, auditorium portion of it. Have you been in the building? Do you know the building at all? In that? That? Yes. Okay. That's my class there. So, um, uh, and then of course there was the, <clears throat> that was built, the original part was built in 1954, I think, or 52. That was an auditorium and an art gallery and a library. That was there. On what was the north side of University Avenue, mm -hmm. which is the that campus entrance now. Yeah. Uh, but University Avenue was a through street mm. at that yeah. time. And in other words, uh, that was before Martin Luther King was built. And in fact, uh, that was the first building that went into what was then part of Burnham Woods Park. And there was a big controversy about that, jumping the University Avenue because at that day, before 1952, that had been the north end of the campus. And <clears throat> so anyway, that was a, a change. Mm -hmm. And then of course, DAP has had two subsequent major additions. And, uh, but uh, it was uh, and, uh, 1958, the classroom, Part was built of the original college that was the three-story portion. Interestingly, the, the library that was on the top floor of the first part didn't have handicapped accessibility. Uh, uh, the elevator in the building didn't go up to the top floor. It had a walk. Oh. And eventually they ended up putting in a <clears throat> chairlift so that we had a handicapped student that other what not he couldn't get into the library and supposedly the reason they didn't build another floor onto the DAP building uh, they could have if you know originally well maybe you don't pay much attention to that but there are brown columns in the old part sort of concrete columns mm -hmm. And in order to put a top floor on, which had been the library floor, which they economized and didn't put enough steel in the columns to support another floor. So therefore, uh, they, you had to walk up to the library before they put the chair in. Uh, you might say that's false economy, but in those days, uh, people weren't concerned about the handicap particularly. One of the things we used to do when started to uh, become part of architectural practice that you had to accommodate handicapped people, we used to uh, put students in wheelchairs in the building and then uh, see how we could navigate. Then they realized that uh, they couldn't get in toilet rooms because of the way they were constructed. Mm -hmm. Couldn't make the turns, uh, which that was a good lesson to them. They couldn't get in the building. They say, "Well, go to the library." Well, we can't go to the library because there's no waiting for somebody in a wheelchair to get up there. Uh, and steps to, up to buildings instead of ramps and things were not uh, possible in those days. The only ramp into the original tap building was at the loading dock. Okay. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Which is hard to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is. But that's uh, 
But this is how the practice of architecture, certainly or the design buildings, has certainly changed because of the federal requirements to accommodate the handicapped. Mm -hmm. Very necessary. Even crosswalks, as you know, have ramps now. And uh, so well, it didn't used to be there. So a curb was a major obstacle to somebody in a wheelchair. Or crutches or even old doddering people. Okay. <clears throat> but the campus uh, certainly has changed. And uh, we used to say UC for many years was stood for under construction. You've heard that one, I know. And uh, the main campus is pretty much done. They're pretty much done. Uh, probably with the exception of uh, they really haven't come up with any real ideas, uh, made public anyway, of what to do with the old library area and the YMCA, which is a fine building, but uh, it's deteriorating. And, um, talk about making it a uh, sort of a reception center for the university and doing remodeling or new construction there. But uh, that's probably going to be the one area where there's going to be a, some major changes over the year. Okay. But what's changed, uh, a lot has changed physically, of course, even the boundaries of the campus. Mm -hmm. uh, you know Jefferson Avenue, of course. Yeah. Uh, and Jefferson Avenue is an interesting street because uh, it runs right into the Environmental Health Center, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't used to. It used to go Jefferson there, connected to Jefferson beyond the Environmental Health Center. Uh, that was an interesting exercise. And uh, that, uh, you see, you have to put the university as a city university in context um, with city planning and development. Uh, Cincinnati has been a leader at one time in planning, urban planning. It had plans uh, that were done for parks. Well, the reason they have a great park system in the city is because planning done back in the 20s. The 1930s uh, planning was done. Uh, and after World War II, because there was no construction during that time, and relatively modest construction in the 30s because of the Depression. Uh, the decided that in order to uh, expand cities, uh, because the fabric of cities was old, getting older, they had to uh, have a federal program for urban renewal. And at that time, urban renewal funds were primarily a competition. Uh, they had a certain amount of money set aside, and then the cities applied for them. And based upon, and to some degree, the merit of the, comp of the application, depending on how much money they got. But mainly, they were focusing on uh, rehabilitation. Uh, a lot of it uh, was also connected with the Federal Defense Highway System, or the interstate, as it mm -hmm. was called, originally called the Defense Highway System, uh, patterned after the German Autobahns, World War II, that Hitler built. And of course, uh, our Autobahns, Defense Highway Systems, went right through the center of cities. Uh, the German built theirs remote from the city, around the city, so they couldn't be put out of action by enemy bombing. But of course, that wasn't the point here. But the system was sold as a defense highway system, the interstate, initially. And of course, we all know what that became. Mm -hmm. When I first moved to Cincinnati, uh, 75 uh, ended at Ludlow Avenue and Central Parkway. That's we came in, that's when then you proceeded into the city along Central Parkway, 
Well, of course, it was expanded through the West End mm -hmm. and the bridge across into Kentucky and then you know, tying it in. Circle Freeway, when I first came here, the first spur of it was built off 75 and it went over to the uh, shopping center, Tri County. Mm -hmm. That was one short little piece. And that was it. That was, of course, drawn on paper. Naturally, they were going to build it, but that was what was constructed. So, to give you an idea of the <coughs> scope. Of, and, of course, the highway system, as you know, led to a suburban expansion. Mm -hmm. And also, the highway system, as it penetrated cities and moved through, uh, resulted in the clearance of a lot of areas. Uh, just so happened many of them were lower income areas. No question about that. But on the other hand, uh, they certainly tried to get as close as they could to the urban core. And unfortunately, most of the fringes of the urban core were where uh, poor people lived. And so that was, if you were going to move, get as close as you could, you had to obviously tear down some of the uh, deteriorated, supposedly deteriorated areas. Not all of them necessarily were, but it uh, led to a lot of uh, displacement. And at one time, Cincinnati had the largest urban renewal clearance program in the country. And that was down in the West End. Uh, that's where Interstate 75 went through and all of that clearance uh, was there. Uh, and one of the things that cities had to do when they funding, they had to come up with, I, I remember, 10% of the cost of the funds they got from the federal government for urban renewal. That's a match. Mm -hmm. Well, this is where the university came in. And Jefferson Avenue has changed because uh, they bought land between what was the campus and expanded to the east to Jefferson Avenue. And they also built three apartment buildings. You know, two of them are there mm -hmm. now, and the third one has been re the third one was replaced. And that was the city's contribution to match the federal urban renewals fund was to expand the university, which is interesting. Uh, what is it? Campus Green, of course, at that time before that was a parking lot called Lot One. That's where the students parked. Okay. Because so, basically this was a commuter school. It didn't have a lot of dormitories for uh, residents of students. It still don't have enough when the mm -hmm. campus grown. But uh, anyway, that was an interesting major change. And of course, uh, another thing that was done uh, to the east of the campus was the Avondale Coryville Renewal Project. That was the largest urban rehabilitation project in the country at one time. Wow. So you had Cincinnati had the largest project, urban renewal project in the West End. And they had then the urban, largest urban rehabilitation project. Uh, both of them had problems. Uh, if you study the West End, and maybe you have or haven't, but uh, uh, it's been characterized in some way as one of the largest urban parking lots in the country. Because what they ended up building was low density apartment or low density development. Uh, it was much more dense before the interstate was plowed through and of course before the uh, clearance program, the 
problem with the clearance program was that they had the mistaken idea if they built new infrastructure, new roads, sewers, mm -hmm. all the utilities were new, uh, that all these industrial sites that had been there in, you might say, multi-story or older industrial buildings were going to flock back. Well, that didn't make as much sense uh, after the fact because what, if you have a company that is being displaced, the company's got money to move, mm -hmm. relocate. So where did they relocate? Out of the suburbs, where they could get enough land for parking, which they didn't have where they were, yeah. and uh, also where they could build factories horizontally, and also that they were able to uh, have enough space for expansion. And so that when they rehabilitated the West End, the Kenyan Bar was called the West End, uh, they said, well, move back in. And said, we don't want to move back in. We don't want. We should move back into the center of the city. We like it where it is. Mm -hmm. The executives could get there from Indian Hill and Hyde Park easily. Uh, and of course, the workers, they've got to drive. They better have a car. And poor workers that can't afford a car, well, too bad. Too bad. So, uh, anyway, that's part of the problem with the West End, mm -hmm. which they should have done in retrospect. They should have done it in phases. And so it said to a company, well, we've got this nice site. We will move you from block A, where you are now, and got to a wheel. we've got block B ready for your new factory. And, but they didn't do that. They had to tear it all down at one time. And it just took too long. So that, they learned a lesson there. Mm -hmm. You can have urban renewal that is too, kind of, if you want people to stay, you've got to provide a place for them to go to that's more or less close to where they are. But up on the hilltop, where we have a rehabilitation program. And so the idea was that urban rehabilitation was a combination of new development and rehab houses, living places. Well, that's a good idea. Uh, and one of the problems that, of course, they wanted to combat was uh, institutional expansion. Now you have to understand that Martin Luther King Highway was built because uh, this was called Pill Hill. See, all the hospitals were concentrated in around the medical. So it used to be, of course, UC's hospital, General Hospital it was called, mm -hmm. where the medical school is now. See, uh, there was a Jewish hospital, children's hospital, right there. Bethesda Hospital was on Reading Road. Uh, we had Good Samaritan here, and a Deaconess Hospital, it's gone now, tearing that down. And that, this was the, you know, the hospital complex. So the idea was you built, uh, Martin Luther King to tie into Western and Northern Boulevard and you pushed it across the city and tie it into 71 so that, which didn't get done initially, mm -hmm. but uh, so that people, and but you know, it was extended on into Walnut Hills, so people in the east side and the west side could get to the hospital complex. So what happened to the hospitals? Where Deaconess is closed, Bethesda is closed, Jewish hospital moved to Kenwood, uh, and 
you know, uh, many hospitals have been established around the perimeter to better serve the suburban community rather than having people run in. And now, I must admit that the most intensive care emergency room in the urban area is at UC's hospital. That's where all the gunshot wounds go and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. If you want to see action on a Saturday night, uh, camp out there and look at the problems that uh, are there. Uh, but anyway, but you see, uh, that was planning. So let's get back to Coryville Urban Renewal. Uh, the problem was between the East and West Campus, uh, there was uh, residential development and uh, the university wanted to tie the two campuses together. That was a plan. Um, you know where the old or where the nursing school is now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Proctor Hall. Uh, that building was constructed there was a gift from the proctors that Proctor and Gamble uh, to the university to finance a school of nursing. And they said, oh, it had to be right there on that corner. Well, that wasn't true. They didn't have any strings attached to it. It could have been any place, but the university wanted it there as part of the change. One of the problems of doing that was the street between there, one down in uh, where the Marriott Hotel is now, uh, that was a gully. And there was a recreation building there, Coryville Recreation, and a baseball field. And that was on Eden Avenue, which runs into the medical school. And there was also another little street, I guess it was called Pam Street. Uh, and that street had the largest concentration of houses that were been rehabilitated in the whole Avondale Coryville neighborhood. But in expansion, what they did, of course, was to tear down those houses and tear down the you know, the community center, which they rebuilt, of course, uh, over in the uh, University Avenue. And, he, uh, and which kind of leads to the question, well, we spent all this money to rehab these buildings for people, their modest means, because that was the idea. And uh, the, uh, University expanded into them, so all that money was wasted. Now, I'll give you a one anecdote about that. Uh, I was a member of a group called North Cincinnati Neighbors at that time, which was a community group. It's no longer in existence. They have community councils and things, a little different makeup now. But anyway, we went to, uh, uh, there was a minister in an Episcopal church in Mount Auburn, and we, uh, went around and were talking to uh, people uh, in the neighborhood about this expansion of the university mm -hmm. because, and Martin Luther King uh, expansion. This was all part of that. And uh, I remember two things. Uh, one group was a man, a uh, black man, was sitting on his front porch. This was a Saturday afternoon. and. Uh, he said, uh, he said, what do you, we asked him, what do you think about this having to move? And he said, I don't want to, but I have to, because uh, he said, this is the third time I'm going to move. I had a house in the West End, which Urban Renewal took, and they told me where, he asked, where can I go? And they said, well, go to Coryville. We've got some money for you there to fix up a house. So he moved to bought a house, got a loan to fix it up, moved to Coryville, and uh, 
Now they, once he was there, a few years, not too long, he was told, well, you gotta move again. And he, I remember he said, you know, I get older and tireder. <laughs> uh, the, but he said, you know, and I say, but it's, this is for young people. He said, that's good. Yeah, but anyway, that was, was one thing I remember from that. And then there was the other one, was there was a drugstore on the corner of what is Vine Street. It was a commercial building. I think three stories high, and a house next to it. <clears throat> and uh, we went to the house next to it, the drugstore at that time was closed. And the man uh, <clears throat> was there, and his, <clears throat> his uh, wife or sister, I can't remember, met us. We went and talked. Why are you here? And we were just trying to see what your feelings is about having to move. And uh, Woman said, "Well, uh, don't don't mention my, I think it was husband or brother, because uh, we grew up in this house and we ran the drugstore next door. It's closed." And he said, "But if you mention why you're here, if he when he comes in, he's going to break down and cry." And so of course he came in and why? And they broke down and cried because he was being forced to move. So stories like that led to the fact that, okay, we've got to uh, draw the line. How big is the university going to expand, institutional expansion? Well, what's happened? The university drew lines. Everybody said, oh, well, okay. We will continue the rehabilitation changes up to that. Well, planning is something that is not static. Planning is dynamic. Cities are dynamic. And so they change. And what was a good idea the one time, uh, 10 years later, well, not quite such a good idea. Hindsight's wonderful. And uh, I mentioned about the nursing school. The university said, well, they had to have the nursing school at that corner. That's where uh, Miss Proctor wanted it. Well, that was not true. They didn't need to do it, but that's where the university wanted it, to build the bridge between the east and west campus. And then subsequently, they built the Marriott Hotel and administration building. Uh, so uh, these are changes that were made, not necessarily to the benefit of the people that were being forced to leave or forced to change. And we see that now, you could, uh, pressures of development, the university have changed. Look at the apartment buildings that are being built. And look at Straight Street, as that's going to become. Uh, the developers there call it Straight, or Grape Street, it's going to be. Well, they're talking about building a 15-story apartment building on part of it. Now, where the old deaconess hospital has been torn down. They're going to build an office building. <clears throat> and guess who's going to be the tenant? The university. Of course. They're going to rent it from the developer because they need more office space. Uh, we don't have a faculty club anymore at the university. That's gone. Now, the faculty club, uh, well, we didn't have one when I first came to the campus. Uh, we had a faculty dining room in Macon Hall, or uh, uh, student union. And uh, so basically, that's where faculty, if they wanted to be collegiate, uh, would go. And, the, uh, then they built a faculty club with uh, where the new business school is. And then they had built, as part of that, an expansion was an alumni center next to it. So they could use the kitchen of the faculty club. 
to, uh, and that was built with uh, faculty club donation. It was built with private money. It was donated to the university. And it was a nice place, and it's fine. In fact, uh, they used to serve dinner there, too, as a matter of fact, as well as lunch. Uh, but uh, this is before uh, the library was built across the street from, a, from that site. Uh, but it, it existed until they decided to tear it down as an expansion for the business school. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, so those are changes that were made, of course. Uh, where the Langsam Library is now, that used to be a hill. That was a bump. And uh, be, there used to be, you know, where, what Snake Road is, where you enter the parking garage for the dam. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, that road used to wind down around through the park and connect. And so uh, that's where faculty parking was. For DAP anyway, because you could get a permit to park there. They didn't allow students to park there. <laughs> In fact, uh, when I first came, uh, faculty parking was free. Students had to pay a little bit yeah. to get a lot one. The faculty was free. Then they gave us a raise, like three hundred dollars a year or something. Like and then they charged three hundred dollars for parking. <laughs> and I remember one of my colleagues who lived in an apartment across Clifton Avenue. Uh, she pointed that out to her glee, because she said, "I can walk to work and you drive." And then Harris goes, "I get to keep my raise and you kind of give it back to the university." <laughs> but that's uh, but basically. If you think about planning from an urban point of view, what's happened, of course, the East and West campuses have come together. Uh, the latest big institution expansion has been Children's Hospital, of course, moving to the north, and that's created a, you know, problems. Uh, but there's going to be more expansion as the new 71 exit to Martin Luther King has created a whole area of expansion there, and that's going to change radically. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is the phenomenon of gentrification of the whole inner city. Who would have thought that over the Rhine would be a place that people would clamor to move into? I'll give you an example of that. I was offered a building on the corner of, uh, oh dear, in over the Rhine one time, uh, the corner of Orchard Street and, uh, well, I can't remember the East North South Street. Uh, anyway, uh, for $12,000. Orchard Street's a little short street that runs between Main Street and uh, uh, a street to the east. And uh, a friend of mine just bought a house on Orchard Street a couple of years ago and has put $800,000 into it. Wow. Now, Diagonally across the street, back in the early 1970s, I could have had a house that's still there for twelve thousand dollars. That's crazy. <laughs> crazy, it is. It's crazy. But people are clamoring to come back in the city, and that's. But you know, one time I was to go to the suburbs. And now it's well. What's the reason for change? Well, for one thing, uh, aging a population. Uh, also, the fact that uh, commute time and the lack of any rapid transit that amounts to anything, uh, was it doesn't help suburbia at all. And uh, 
So an inadequate bus service, certainly. The, uh, there used to be a man in our faculty, part-time, named Vladislav Sigo, which is a, a, no longer alive. But uh, Mr. Sigo was a, one of the more prominent urban planners in the country, and he worked on the master plan for the city of Cincinnati in the 1940s. Uh, and his proposal for the interstate highway system as it came into the city was to put dedicated bus lanes in that were for traffic, was an extra lane. Well, they didn't do that. You see, they wanted to economize. Mm -hmm. So you had, uh, so they didn't build, uh, and Seiko says, well, you're going to need it. We got all these people that are moving out of the country. Oh, well, we. We're going to ride in the cars. He said, it's going to be too congested. So, there, so what do we have? Congestion. City of Lyon, one of the interesting planning situations in the country, one of the fastest growing cities in the country is Austin, Texas. And which is the capital and the University of Texas is there. Yeah and it's become a tech area. And one of the problems they have is they don't have any rapid transit. And people that live in the suburbs, many of them, have to have pet a tear in the city so they don't have to commute, you know, an hour and a half each way to get in to work. You know, that's so, obviously, you know, people that, uh, want to work downtown, many of them say, well, I want to live downtown, that counts for the over the Rhine. And some of the changes, and well, of course, that has led to, you know, displacement. Big what was over the Rhine, basically. That was people that had been displaced in the West End, a lot of them moved over the Rhine. They also moved to uh, Quarryville, and Avondale. And a lot of this goes back to changing of zoning regulations. So that, you know, uh, World War II had some effect on that uh, because it was a housing shortage, you weren't building any new, and industry was expansion, expanding. And they changed zoning regulations so you could take a neighborhood like Avondale and big houses and subdivide them into apartments. And that's one of the reasons that led to the decline of Mount Auburn and uh, Avondale was because of the change of zoning regulations. But it was needed at the time. They weren't building, they didn't have money for new housing. People had to live someplace. You were coming into the city uh, from the countryside, whether it's Kentucky or further south, to work in industry, because the jobs were here, that's necessity, they moved, uh, they had a place to live. And so it led to overcrowding and deterioration, and people that had the money to move further out did. So the university, you know, has expanded and it continues to expand. Many, you know, many changes, and, and what we're going to see probably the most construction is going to be along Martin Luther King over to the east, between the, and they're going to build a, a new environmental health center over there. Uh, so that's uh, along with other development that's going to take place. So it's a, you know, the cities are dynamic; they aren't static. And if they try to be static, uh, well, what's, what's Venice today? It's a tourist attraction. It's also sinking. And the problem in Venice is that people, uh, you know, there's so many tourists, no one wants to live there permanently, even though it's a you know, desirable place. 
but uh, that's been one of the criticisms. And, uh, so that's another whole issue. You get into the idea of tourism. And, but, you know, you're, these are all planning things. Uh, so the university has changed, the university has grown, and uh, uh, of course I've changed with it as I came to teach design uh, and architecture. Uh, I became interested in historic preservation and we started a multidisciplinary program back in the 1970s uh, in historic preservation. You get a certificate in that, a certificate program, which I thought at the time and still believe is the way that it should be taught. So it's interdisciplinary and that uh, it's a non-degree program at the present time. Uh, but uh, I think that it should be part of the tools of any designer or urban planner or urbanist uh, or even uh, his image geographers and geologists and that, that they become acquainted with and knowledgeable about preserving what we've got. And that's important. And one of the Cincinnati, uh, certainly over the Rhine, uh, is probably the largest concentration of Victorian architecture in the country. Now, you know, things are changing there too. New constructions uh, being added. Uh, there are rules and regulations to hopefully try to make it more compatible uh, with what's existing historic fabric. But uh, that is an important thing. So uh, we don't have maverick buildings cropping up, you know, high rises and things that uh, change the scale primarily. But the desire is there, so the desire is to increase the pressures on to build more housing. One of the things that they talked about down there is uh, eliminating uh, much of the requirement for parking for new construction. Uh, well, <clears throat> that's okay. And many people, uh, you got a driver's license? Yeah. Okay, you would do too. Well, then you got a car. Both of you? Yeah. Okay. Well, not everybody's got a car, but most people, certainly younger people and older people, do depend on the car. I haven't ridden a bus in Cincinnati in decades. Although, I live here because of the proximity to the university. Mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, for many years, uh, you know, almost well, a little over 40 years, I had an office over at Vine Street, Short Vine. Well, there's an interesting street. See, Vine Street used to continue on through Quarryville and wasn't interrupted. Now it goes to Jefferson and then jogs back. Uh, so they built a shopping center. But there used to be a hill there. There was a water tower, water tank on the hill, right about where uh, ooh, the parking lot for Kroger's is. If you, if you think about Vine Street coming up and going through, uh, it was on the west side of Vine Street, between there and Jefferson water tank. And it's hard to imagine. And of course, urban renewal for Evandale Quarryville. Well, okay, well, we can get rid of that. And uh, my office was a little house that's still there, 2606 Vine Street. Uh, the, uh, they filled in a gully in the back supposedly with the dirt and fell from the hill. 
That wasn't necessarily true, but that's what the myth was, that they were going to use that to fill, and then they put a parking lot in there behind those buildings on the east side of Short Line, mm -hmm. in that block, first block. So anyway, then they, of course, had a shopping center that has since been torn down and rebuilt with a new Kroger store and a new Walgreens. Uh, which doesn't have enough parking, if you've been there. Yeah. Totally inadequate parking because uh, they closed the Kroger store in Walnut Hills, which Kroger claimed to do adequate business to warrant keeping it open, uh, which is probably true. But the uh, new store, and, and the idea was that if you have a pharmacy, in your drugstore, you want drive-in, drive-through. That's the whole key. If you don't have a drive-through pharmacy as part of your store or your drugstore, you can't compete. So CPS built a drugstore up there on McMillan and Vine, and uh, they've got a they have a drive-through. Kroger didn't, and Walgreens didn't, and the old shopping center. So, there's an interesting problem, or an interesting change. Not necessarily, all changes, not necessarily for the best. But, uh, anyway, the dynamic of the neighborhood will continue to change. Mount Auburn has changed. Uh, there used to be a church in the corner of Auburn Avenue and McMillan, which was the oldest, that was the first church at the top of the hill. And in fact, uh, a developer bought it, tore it down. No. And he wants to build an apartment building, going to. Because what is the expansion is there, and they can rent them out. And have more restaurants, and well, anyway, that's a whole another story. We even got a Target, haven't we? Well, anyway, uh, cities are dynamic; they change, and uh, not necessarily always. For the better, uh, but uh, Cincinnati, of course, has changed in many ways slower than others. Uh, I think that uh, trying to preserve the best of the past is, is important, and that needs to be. And we need to serve the, save the best of the past at the university. I mourn the loss of Wilson Auditorium. You remember where that was? Ah. Well, you know where those temporary buildings are on Clifton Avenue, right across from Dapp? That was what Wilson Auditorium was there. There's a picture of it in here. Uh, Wilson Auditorium was a uh, building built uh, in the 30s. And they used to do, uh, back before they College Conservatory of Music, or uh, moved to campus. Uh, that's where they had their theater. And uh, so, I, and of course, the campus changed. The, the uh, first part of it was they built uh, for the whole complex up there uh, for the theater and music and all of that up there. Uh, they built a building. Uh, which is basically gone. Uh, part of it was, of course, uh, the second phase of it became the auditorium for the school, which has since been remodeled. But the original part of the school, school uh, was, uh, college was a classroom building, basically, built over a parking garage. 
done by an architect in town uh, at the time. His name was Ed Schulte. He was a prominent architect. That was his last project. And the joke was it wasn't a very good building design-wise. And they said he should have retired one building earlier. But that's, uh, fortunately, they got a New York architect, I am paying. Uh, it's firm to do it, but the expansion of it and do the remodeling, although the uh, second theater was done before the latest phase of the office building, and, uh, the Craftsman building in front of it. But, uh, you know, it's, but that's, it was a major change in the campus when they took the college conservatory or the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and the university took it over and moved it to the main campus. <laughs> I remember uh, when I first came here, we used to, uh, they would try to enlist faculty people to make telephone calls to people and get them to contribute. Uh, have any of you ever done that? Well, you know, uh, and you know, as a young assistant professor, I thought I'd probably get extra points that way. Uh, and uh, so I remember calling up one evening, uh, and I got this man who said, he said, where are you from, what are you doing? He said, well, <clears throat> I'm calling Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati, and about contribution. University of Cincinnati. He said, I used to teach at the college or at the Conservatory of Music. The university took it over, but I didn't get a pension. He said, I taught there for decades. And they took it over, and I haven't got anything but Social Security. So, that's just a Probably that will get stricken away from the recording. <laughs> but, you know, physical change is, uh, goes along with changes of program. Programs are flexible. Some come, some go. Uh, uh, interesting, uh, architecture is interesting because uh, the co-op program, which is really Cincinnati's engineering and architecture and other programs, is a strong point. That's, that's one of the reasons for success. I remember uh, I used to go to conferences and I was in Boston and I met a man who uh, we were talking and he said, well, he said, you know, in my firm in Boston, of course, we we're under pressure really to hire MIT and Harvard graduates. And so when anybody else comes in looking for a job, well, you know, we haven't got anything. But he said if the University of Cincinnati graduate comes in looking for a job, I want to talk to him. Because he said they've had experience. And that was in many ways opened the door for students. Uh, it wasn't easy always. They, co-op program in the 30s was very tough to find jobs because architects didn't have jobs. Uh, the, uh, but, uh, and I remember when I first came, we had a faculty person who was part of the co-op program and his uh, uh, job was to find jobs for students. And he was finding jobs in local firms and things for him because uh, uh, they had, had jobs for students back in the 30s. Even though they didn't have a lot of work, they, some of the bigger firms, you know, tried to accommodate them. It was hard to find jobs for students in those days, but it prevailed. And fortunately, uh, it was the strength of the program. Now, uh, a few years ago, well, many years ago now, they changed the program to a, uh, not 
a professional program. In other words, now you have to get a master's degree in architecture for your professional degree. Uh, you can get a bachelor's, and I guess it's architectural studies, which is a four-year. And the idea was that you would continue on uh, and do more years. Uh, it was a six-year program anyway. So he would continue on and get a master's degree. Well, one of the problems uh, they've encountered is that many of the better students don't continue on. They stop going to UC, and where do they want to go to graduate school? Well, I want to go to Harvard, or I want to go to MIT, or Michigan, or what have you. And that's a problem. And so, some architectural schools are switching back to granting a professional undergraduate degree, which is really what you need is a professional degree to get a license. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, again, pendulum swing. Uh, so, what are you studying? You, well, okay, you study urban studies. Yes. Uh, the, uh, and one of the real problems is finding jobs when you get out. Think of the poor English student, mm -hmm. English major, or the history major. What do you do? I know you, you want to be a teacher in a grade school or high school. Well, you've got to have, you know, your licensing for that. So you have to continue on. If you, uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, humanities are hard hit. And uh, so computers are big, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be go into computer science. Uh, but that may change. So anyway, cities, education programs, you know, medical care, they're all, they all change, they all move on. And some people just stay in the same house for 50 years. So you talk a lot about all that other stuff. And then next, uh, like, about like students themselves, like I'm guessing, like you notice like a change in like the diversity of the students and like, Staff about your years? Well, I've taught basically too much for 20 years. So obviously, uh, um, certainly students today are coming in much more computer literate. You know, it's an assumption I'm almost made that, uh, you know, they come to school with a laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when we first started to introduce computers, this was a big deal. We had a computer lab. Now everybody has a computer, and they take notes and, on their computer, sitting there typing away. Well, uh, so there's a probably uh, more and more. I think is going to higher education is uh, going to become more. You might say computerized or packaged. Uh, it doesn't make sense that if you have an outstanding historian, and maybe on the faculty of uh, Princeton or Brown or Berkeley, that uh, they can't, students can't watch a lecture by them at their leisure, not necessarily at the time. And benefit from it and then go someplace where they can have, which is important, uh, seminars with people, faculty, or upper level graduate students where they can discuss the topic. And in fact, in theory, you probably could uh, pack a lot more education into that kind of a program. And I think, uh, you know, it's talked about a lot. Uh, 
faculty to a degree resist that. You know, they don't want to be replaced by somebody <laughs> at Harvard. That's never been in Cincinnati. But uh, what we've done, of course, in universities, unfortunately, is more and more graduate students or upper level graduate students are doing the teaching at relatively low salaries. In fact, they qualify for food stamps in some cases, which is pretty sorry. And to find jobs in academia is very tough today. That's tough. To get tenure, wow, that's a major accomplishment. And in fact, a lot of people in the state legislature would like to do away with tenure. Uh, you know, faculty people, and all they do is sit around and drink coffee and, you know, don't do any work. Well, that's, uh, I never thought that, but on the other mm -hmm. hand, uh, still, those are, you know, those are changes in the attitude of the public toward academics uh, and students. Uh, certainly, uh, hopefully, that's, students are better equipped in some areas and maybe not in others. Like, uh, you know, I don't know whether uh, somebody has a knowledge of history of the city or a history of the state and, uh, or the country they come from, necessarily. Uh, it's assumed that somehow you get it, but you don't, unless it's taught to you or you're forced to read it. Uh, not that it can't be compressed, uh, but uh, if you're not exposed to it, or uh, you aren't going to necessarily seek it out. So, you know, that's a question. So, um, okay, so yeah, you've talked like a lot about a lot of these questions I have. And then, uh, so I have, uh, where, where do you like see UC going in the future? Well, <clears throat> Well, I hope that UC uh, maintains the co-op program because I think that's extremely important in higher education. Uh, but I do think that you also need to have, be exposed to the liberal arts too. You cannot just focus on a technical program and not have any philosophical background for it for life. I think that's important. Uh, without, you have to broaden your experience and exposure. Uh, I used to think as an architect that uh, new buildings are new would solve all the problems of living. All we had to do was build brand new and everything would be wonderful. Well, that isn't the case, is it? Not at all. And in fact, you can get along fairly well in old buildings. But now, uh, I think that the university uh, needs to respond to the fact dynamic situation, and they're trying. No question about that. We've got an aging population. Uh, that is commonly, of course, we have programs for study for the aging, you know, retirees, I should say. And uh, that's very good. Uh, continuing education program. We used to have, uh, when I first started, we used to have a night school. And you could get a degree from evening college, which is interesting. I used to teach some classes there. They always regarded it as not quite up to standard, not just that you got your degree at evening college, but 
there are some engineering degrees you could get, uh, which is interesting. And of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, lawyers in this city that uh, uh, used to go to a evening law school. It was located in the old and the YMCA down on Central Parkway. Uh, it was, became Northern Kentucky's law school. And uh, but. Uh, the idea that people can have an education and still work if they want to improve the job, I think is something that uh, is important that uh, sh and should be encouraged. But, you know, paying for it's tough. Tuition's high. Uh, and that's one of the real problems that university has is finding ways to, uh, you know, keep students without forcing them to go bankrupt or their parents to go bankrupt. So that's a, that's a whole problem. You know, another problem <clears throat> I just mentioned, uh, everything, the emphasis on everything is new. Well, things get old, and when they get old, uh, they either get torn down if they're not taken care of, or you've got to spend money to take care of them. And that's another problem we have in this country. They talk about the state of Ohio, the roads, and they you know, just increase the gasoline tax to help pay for roads and some people can, are saying, wow, I gotta pay more to commute uh, because you raised my gasoline tax and you didn't give me any more money. And you can also say that's a regressive tax because if you you know make hundred fifty or two hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, you know, a few extra cents on your gasoline bill as you commute to your office or your campus or whatever it is, or your medical hospital, doesn't make any difference. But if you're the janitor or the, the you know, has to commute to in, in a car that's not too good, that extra 10 or 15 or 30 cents a gallon, that's a big deal. Uh, and, that, and the same thing is true of cost of education. You can say, well, it's good to have co-op, and that does help to some degree uh, with expenses, but uh, they have to find a way, I think, the universities, uh, higher education needs to control uh, the cost or some way that so people and get an education. Well, not everybody needs to go to a university, that's true. They still need plumbers and electricians and things like that and painters and that to uh, keep up the old buildings. But these are problems that uh, society faces. The university is a microcosm of society so in that respect. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, during your time at the university, what were you, like, most proud of that you, like, accomplished? <laughs> well, I, I'm pleased we had, could start a preservation program. Uh, I served on a, the old uh, Urban Conservation Board uh, back in the 60s and another that uh, we are responsible for uh, buildings that are protected by city ordinance. Uh, this goes back to the whole history of historic preservation, which basically in this country, to a degree, well, started back in the 1930s, but I won't go into a history lesson of historic preservation. Uh, but uh, 
we realized uh, it was realized that uh, the city needed to protect certain historic areas. And so they established some historic districts. One is the Dayton Street in the West End. The other was the Lytle Park area. These are the two main ones. Uh, there are much more now. And certain civic buildings, city hall, uh, music hall, were under the purview of the board. And basically, uh, I got appointed to that board. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one of our part-time faculty people that you see, a man named George Roth, and uh, you know, I admired him, and he, he taught history as a volunteer teacher. He taught senior architectural history on Saturday mornings and donated his money back to the college. So he taught for nothing because he just enjoyed it uh, and wanted to serve and had gone to UC as an undergraduate and uh, became a partner in a prestigious firm. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, so I was uh, on that board and then I got appointed to the State Historic Sites Preservation Advisory Board which was a board that reviewed all the things that were put on the National Register of Historic Places, which was a process that was creating National uh, Historic Places uh, back in 1965. And so the state had a board that would review those, and that's a complicated process, but it's all under the auspices of the National Park Service. And uh, anyway, so I served on that board for a long time, and then I started, to, uh, because of that, uh, I was chairman of that board for five years, and uh, I first started teaching preservation courses as a freebie. Uh, I was interested in it, and certain the students said, well, you're enjoying this one. And I said, okay. And so, in fact, that's the way a couple of courses got started at UC uh, in the architectural program. Uh, uh, when I first went there, uh, we didn't have a course, uh, let's see what I'd call building construction, uh, which was kind of strange uh, because it was assumed that the students would get their hands-on experience construction working in an architect's office. We didn't need to teach in building construction. Well, architects started, well, it'd be nice if they, if when they started a co-op in their second year, half, second half, they had some knowledge of how buildings are structurally put together. And so we started a free course in building construction. And, that, and then they finally hired somebody to do that. We had structural courses, but it was uh, not actually, you know, how to put a couple pieces of wood together. And that, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, those are changes. That, uh, but in putting the historic preservation program, we, uh, there was interest. There was a planning professor who was interested in it, planning because. Uh, I got a degree in graduate planning from the University of Cincinnati uh, back in the uh, 1960s. And uh, after I came here, with a part-time student, you might say, at that time uh, there was a graduate program in city planning or community planning and an undergraduate program. The undergraduate program was the DAAP. The graduate program was in the graduate school sort of an offshoot of the geography department. That's what really got us started. And so we had a program. And one of the things was that our graduates were getting jobs in planning because it was a hot thing. Uh, federal government said, if you want to get money from us, you have to have a planning program and have a plan developed. 
for a community. So the community said, well, hey. And then we started the health planning program. Uh, so that is still in operation. So that's an important. And so we had, uh, so it was planning, people were involved in you know, their process. And historic preservation was important. And there was a man in the uh, geology department that was interested in it because part of the preservation program was for the feds that archaeological sites. And a lot of historic archaeological sites are on there, not all in ancient Greece. You know, that's under the auspices of the classics program. But we had, you might say, two archaeology programs at the university. One in classics, which is just that, going, you know, into classical mm -hmm. investigation. And then we had, uh, uh, you might say, North American archaeology. And and we had a geographer, and we had people in the business school because they realized that, hey, you know, real estate is important. And so we said, well, let's establish, we all got together, and uh, as a faculty people I decided, let's try to develop a program that could bring students from various disciplines together to study this problem of historic preservation of saving old buildings, or as we like to say, saving the best of the past, and how to protect them. And so that's how our certificate program came about. And uh, uh, it isn't, when I say it again, it's uh, something I feel like certificates are, you know, some kind of a extra thing that you do a major, to my way of thinking, every architect who graduates should have a knowledge of saving old buildings, not just tearing down everything and building new. Because uh, a lot of architectural practice in firms is involved in working with old buildings or existing buildings. Well, it's like everything and uh, was there anything else you'd like to tell me that we haven't really talked about? No, I can't think of anything. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, is there anyone that you would like to recommend for like a future interview for us? Well that's a good question. Uh, well let me think of DAAP people. So many of the people that I knew there have retired, you see, and gone uh, uh, to Hilton Head and thereabouts, or Florida, or not too many. Uh, uh, Gilbert Bourne, Gil Bourne, is a man who uh, used to teach industrial design. He lives in Cincinnati in Clifton. Yeah. And he would be a good contact person because he can give you, and he's also uh, got a degree, a graduate degree in planning, as a matter of fact. But uh, uh, he's certainly one person that I could think that uh, would be, uh, you know, a good program, person to talk to. That, uh, uh, David Lee Smith, another person, who's a retired uh, faculty person who lives in Clifton, Mm -hmm. So, I don't know too many of the other retired people, so many of them uh, have uh, moved away one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the issues, of course, of being elderly is as you the older you go, the fewer friends you have left. Anyway. Uh, but those are two people okay. I think you should uh, possibly contact, and I think they'd be happy to talk with you if they aren't in being interviewed already. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I have Gilbert Bourne. Bourne. Okay. And then I have David Lee Smith. David Lee Smith. Right. Okay. Yep. 
They both live in Clifton, so okay, they're yeah. easy to get to. Yeah, they're in the city, so. Mm -hmm. All right. I think uh, I think that's it. That concludes the interview. Well, thank you. Well, my pleasure.